start with some ambient tunes from Mirror's Edge, if you ever played it. Yeah. As you heard earlier, my name is Adam. I'm from a small town called Veszprém in Hungary. And actually, I graduated as a chemical engineer a few, year, few years ago. Beside that, I'm a trainer at my own business with five people. I'm also a lecturer or a teacher at the local university. I'm a curator of the local TEDx event, and I'm also a founder of the local Toastmasters Club, which is a place where you can practice public speaking and leadership. So as you can see, I really need tools like gamification to keep people engaged, because we have so many organizations. In the last few years, when I talked to someone and gamification popped up, they said, oh, gamification is so great, but it's either complicated or expensive. And I said, I don't think so. But, you know, without data, I'm just another man with an opinion. So I started to think, how can I prove myself and how to prove them that they are wrong? And in the next 15 minutes, around 15 minutes, I will tell you my three key insights on how to gamify a university course with zero cost. And I think it is very easy to do that because gamification can be easy and can be cheap. So before we start, I want to say that what I did was not revolutionary. What I did was not magic and especially was not out of the box thinking. If I have a problem and I deeply think it. If I have a problem, somebody somehow already solved it somewhere sometime. So instead of finding new ways of thinking or solutions, I simply search in my box for the answers. If I can't find it in mine, I search others' boxes. And that's exactly what I did at my course. You need to know three things about the Hungarian education system. First, it has a simple five grade system for assessment. The second one is it is mostly frontal education, meaning one person stands in many students and he's the only one who speaks. The third and last one, which I want to discuss, is it contains mostly solo campaigns. No group work at all, mostly. If I wanted to make a good incentive system, I was sure that five grade is hardly enough to do it. That was the first challenge for me. If I wanted to engage students, I had to interact with them. And if I wanted to engage more with the students and I wanted them to interact with each other, I had to create group quests. As you can see, it's a totally different model of the current education systems. And I had some very interesting arguments with the deans and other teachers at the school, but it is not hard to do it. Just use reasoning. I think Anne Coppens was the first who taught me that the content is the first if you want to gamify education. And that was exactly what I did. First, I made a short version, what we will discuss during the semester. Then I made a longer one. I made an extended version of each course. I knew it wasn't the masterpiece, but I thought it will get the job done, and it did. I didn't aim for the perfect one. Hope it will be better next semester or next week. Just use iteration. Okay, I had a very great content. Uh, that time I had to stop for a moment and think before I act. Next one. Next one. Okay, I have a very big content. Let's divide it into four phases according to the player's journey. And this task had a very big impact on my understanding of the whole teaching and learning experience because the teachers usually doesn't design the discovery phase of learning. We have content, we have materials for the first class and the others, we have assessments, but what do we do with the students before they enter to the classroom first time? Usually nothing. The teacher, or actually me, I wrote one or two paragraphs to the online education system. I put it online. The students can 
read it over. They might have some clues, but we will talk about the semester, but that's it. It was my first thing that pops popped out on uh, popped out of my mind. It's my first insight. We had to discover the discovery phase. Okay, that's great, but let's stop again. I knew I had some recurring elements in the process, so I wanted to pick a framework. As you know, I'm an engineer, I really love frameworks because, because they help a lot. As I was searching for a framework, I wanted to find one which is well documented, which I understand mostly and gives me a strategic point of view on design. And the framework I chose was actually Octalysis. Okay, I have a great content. Okay, I have a framework, what I can use. What, the, what was the next step? I spoke to many teachers who use gamification somehow in Hungary, and they said, oh, we found many, many great mechanics. We built it in our courses or lectures, and they didn't affect much. I assume bad implementation played a very big role of it, so I used a three-step method to do that. First, find as many game mechanics as I can. Just gather. Second, find in real life examples of those mechanics. And third, compare those in real life examples to my current processes. If there are any similarities or chances to improve my process, I will use the game mechanics behind the example. So it's not just a randomly picked game mechanics because I know how it works. I have an example of it during work. That's exactly what I said. Okay. At that time, I had a plan, what I can execute on. What was my next step? I don't or didn't want it to spend any money on this, on this project, so I used only free tools. I created a Facebook group, I used the Prezi. Have you ever heard about Prezi? Of course, yes, shake hand, yeah, oh, great. I used many uh, documents at Google Drive, uh, I brought in some tabletop games and Actually, paper and pen was an essential part of it. During the discovery phase, I built in two simple mechanics, elitism and narrative. My course wasn't open for ev everyone at the university. We only opened it to two specific groups of students, one from the economics faculty and another one from the IT and engineering faculties. Not everybody could attain my classes. The second one was the narrative, which made a very big fun, actually. When you send an email that, hi, I want to be a part of your course, you get an email back. And in that email, you could choose a player name to yourself. Here we started to develop an avatar for everybody. And it's free, actually, because I used Google Form to ask those informations. And after you provided your player name, you could choose a guild. You could choose from three different guilds and each has a special power during the semesters. First, you could be an archer. Yeah, you could be an archer who can extend the deadline with three days. It is very valuable to university students because they are always in a rush and have many things to do, lectures to attend, and so on. Or you could be a necromancer who has one plus life. You know, if you miss a class, you lose a life. If you miss four or more classes, you cannot attend the final exam, which was actually the great war, because you were a warrior at my classes. You had to make solo quests, group quests, and finally, attend the great war. Or you could be a scribe who can ask one question from me during the exam. Yeah, um, more than a half of the students chose to be a scribe and no question was drawn from me. They were so into 
the tests and the campaigns during the final exam, they totally forget that they had this advantage. It was very fun for me, <laughs> actually. <laughs> okay, uh, I was very consistent to this narrative and I used it in every communication we made with the students and they liked it. They did it as well. When they had to send in the first solo assignment, which was the spy mission, a uh, girl sent me this email, actually, oh, Captain, my Captain. I attached the spy mission, which is the, um, yeah, thanks. Although I and my comrades, comrades in the bunker don't really know if there will be a class tomorrow waiting for orders and sugar fox. That's the avatar he, she chose. It was very fun because we used it in every communication, in email, during uh, interpersonal discussions and in Facebook groups and so on and so on. Okay, after the email narrative, I sent out a small and very basic Prezi to them with all of the informations they had to know before they attend my course. They get some basic information about they can, they can collect up to a thousand points during the course, so it's not a five grade system. We converted it by the end of the course, but you can collect up to a thousand points. Uh, the actual or real incentives was two university credits. When will the classes be? And I inserted a small hit list with some recommended sources, and it was actually a bit longer, and some of the people on the hit list is somewhere here in the building. And I built in a simple feedback mechanic. By feedback, I mean I exactly know when the user does that desired action. The last part of the Prezi was a tricky link, a short link. I made it with a Google tool. If you look at that URL, you don't know where it takes you to. It's actually a secret Facebook group. So if a student wants to join the secret Facebook group, I know that they go over that Prezi. That's the only way that they can attend or try to join. So it's a simple feedback mechanism that, yeah, these students go over that Prezi because they try to join my super secret Facebook group. On the first class, we tried a Kahoot. Have you ever used Kahoot? It's a very simple online tool for quizzes. Up you can make questions up to four answers. You can put out to the screen your question and all of the students can join the game on their cell phone and choose the right answer on them. And it was very fun because of the time limits, because, because of the instant feedbacks and the point system. And they were very surprised when I told them we will, we will make many small exams using Kahoot because it's not usual in Hungary. Um, it's not usual to use digital things for assessment most of the time. It is easy for me, for the lecturer, because by the end of the quiz, Kahoot can give me a spreadsheet with all the data I need. It is very easy to process. Okay, we used Kahoot on the first and the second and so on and so on lectures. And there are some obligations that I had to do. In every class, I had to bring in a paper, the students had to write the names and their signatures on them. That's what we call a catalog. That's how we can measure how many classes they attend. It's a bit boring. At least I thought it's a bit boring. So I asked something else in each classes. First, I asked them their player name and then they had to measure the distance between your, their left pinky and thumb with a ruler. The next class, they had to write a player name and the desired travel destination of them. It's not just a simple signature and it was just fun first, but after a few classes, if uh, students come into the classroom, their first route was to go to the desk, see what is the question of the day and what the other classmates 
wrote in. Slow slowly it became an evergreen mechanics because I hadn't, I don't have to do it regularly. Just one question with a paper and a pen. That's all. I think it's almost free, but I'm not sure. <coughs> I wanted to make some solo quests like this Pi mission. You see it earlier. But for the group quest, I asked for help from my friend Peter. Peter is a game manufacturer and designer in Vesprim, and he makes a very special game named Crokinol. Have you heard about Crokinol? No? That's great. Crokinol is a tabletop game, a wooden tabletop game. You can see this one and that one. Two or four players can play with it, and the rules are very simple. You have some discs that you can push, and there are some specific areas that you aim. For example, this one. The next rule is if there are any enemy discs on the table, you have to collide it with yours. There are two more rules, that's all. You can learn the rules about, I don't know, three or four minutes, and the student's task was to play with it at first, and then make suggestions how can we make a better experience in each phase. How can we make easier to learn the rules, or how can we make or how can we keep engaged the veteran players of it? Most of the students came from IT and engineering faculties, so some of the suggestions contained superconductors or randomly appearing knives on the table and somehow levitating discs over the table. They were very creative, and it was just a very simple task that they had to do. We only brought in some tabletop games and it was a very thriving brainstorming using games, so we call it gamestorming, very clever. After we started to use these techniques, a few weeks later I tried to tell these stories to my colleagues, to other teachers, and they said, oh, okay, it sounds very fun for the students, but uh, it makes me a bit anxious. Is it a bit hard? How, m how many minutes does it take to prepare? And I tell them, okay, I made a secret Facebook group. I made two Google Forms. I brought in some pens and papers and some tabletop games. And it was very easy and not so time consuming. And I thought that somehow the teachers think that gamification should be fun for the students only. I don't think so. I think gamification should be fun for the teachers as well, because if you think that gamification is only a task that you have to do, it's not gamification itself. So that's my third insight or thought about it. Gamification should be fun for the teachers. It's not so usual in Hungary to use a Facebook group to communicate with students. They are on Facebook. I am on Facebook. Why not to do that? It's so easy. But I knew I need some active feedback from them because you just scroll up, you s probably see what I wrote in the group, probably not. So I needed some feedback that they actually read or read what I wrote in. So I started to use this hashtag Libo. Libo means goose in Hungarian, as you can see. Uh, when I wrote or posted something in that group, I asked the students to comment hashtag Libo under that post. And after a few uses of it, I started to leave this request from the posts and they kept commenting hashtag Libo in that group. And it has a bigger impact because if you search for that hashtag on Facebook, right now some Hungarian youth leadership conferences use that system also, uh, just smaller ones. You know, Hungary is not so big, but I think it's a very good impact. And some other places, uh, smaller and bigger corporations started to use systems like this. Even in Facebook, 
or some internal communications. It is very easy, very cheap, and a bit funny. You can use any other animals if you want. I think the world changes very quickly. And if you want to survive, if any of us want to survive, we have to learn. We have to learn very quickly and for a very long time. So that's the one who survives, should lifelong learn. But let's go one step further. If everyone wants to learn, you have to teach. And this is the best time and the best place for do that because we have one of the best tool set of the world, which can be easy and can be cheap. So I encourage you, all of you, to start lifelong teaching because I think that's the future. And I have only one challenge for you. If next time you want to gamify anything, higher education, HR, marketing, try to use only free tools. Because actually I think any game mechanics can be used with zero cost. Thank you.